Welcome to the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society. Welcome to ITSP Magazine. Knowledge is power, now more than ever. And hello, everybody. This is Sean Martin, your host of Redefining Cybersecurity here on ITSP Magazine Podcast Network. You're very welcome to a new episode where I have the pleasure of chatting with some really cool people who know much more than me <laughs> about a lot of things. <laughs> I know enough to be dangerous, and uh, I know enough to ask, I think, inter interesting enough questions to help folks uh, think a little differently about how they implement their security programs, not to just uh, protect the business revenue that they, they create, but also protect the value and generate value in the business as well. And today, we're going to be looking at the world of AppSec, application security. And I'm thrilled to have uh, my good friend Francesco on. How are you? Hello, Sean. Very good. good. So across Good the pond see you. From, from each other, but uh, but a, a big warm hug to you nonetheless. Well, we miss each other at Upset Cali, so I, <laughs> next uh, time. I didn't, next I didn't time, get to I'm wrong. get to the beach this time. We did we did see each other this year in London, though, which is a nice Brooke. treat. Nice treat. You and, came to uh, the cold area. I did. <laughs> I, went to, uh, I went to the gray and wet and cold. Uh, but I love it there, and it was, it was a treat seeing you there, and... and uh, We've been talking about getting on another show and having a deeper conversation and a post you put up on LinkedIn, which is where I get a lot of my inspiration these days, uh, prompted me to connect with you to say, let's chat about this. We're not going to name any, uh, any companies here, but I think what I, what I saw in the post and in the thread on, uh, on this particular site gave me pause, let's just say. Um, <laughs> one one for just, I know you can't fix everything overnight, but it's been a while some of these things have existed. We can point to the OWASP top 10. We can say, why are the, why is the top 10 the same? You just kind of reshuffle the, the numbers, but it's still, still effectively the same list after all these years. And I think we're going to get into the point that this isn't just an engineering thing, right? Um, no, it's a gonna, business. We're, I'm going to leave it right there. I'm going to uh, we'll get into some of that. I think people find this, this interesting. Before we dig in, though, uh, Francesco, uh, I certainly know you, and people who've listened to the <laughs> show have heard you here before. But uh, a few words about what you're up to now. Uh, that would be great. Reference. Yeah, that, thank you, Sean. So um, I'm a AppSec practitioner. Uh, by heart and by trade that uh, turned startup a uh, long time ago and then fundamentally took was frustrated on, on how things were looking like from an AppSec side um, the fact that we had fragmented tool across the board and started um, a company called Phoenix Security that um, is basically out there to solve this kind of problem and as an AppSec company uh, you know we are constantly target uh, by people that want to prove that <laughs> we know how to do application security and um, we continuously test because that's our ethos. Um, our internal attack surface management, our external attack surface management, because that's what we do with our own dog food <laughs> instead of just selling it. But in this kind of exercise, and I think that's where the conversation started with Phoenix Security, um, is where we found kind of an interesting gotcha and that sprawled into a whole piece and research and uh, rabbit hole that then ended up in the post that you mentioned. Um, but yeah. No, I love it. And uh, yeah, I think we connected. You were, uh, you were a CISO for a fairly well-known uh, financial institution, helping them with some of this stuff as well. And uh, yeah, I, I enjoy following what you do and, uh, and the work that you that you uh, that you produce and the results that you get from from some of the stuff you engage in. So this isn't about your company. This isn't about necessarily your your research, but you're you get to see a lot of things. So maybe let's paint a big picture here, 
kind of some of the stuff you've experienced over the last 12 months uh, as we approach the end of the year here. Um, yeah, I was kind of joking, not really, about the OWASP top 10 kind of being still relevant. What, what's, your, what's your thought on that looking back on this year? So uh, I think I'm, I'm, I'm fairly optimistic. Um, on the past couple of years, I've seen really a shift in gear. And with Phoenix Security, we engage a lot on the vulnerability management side, on the application security side. And I've seen these two worlds finally coming together, together with the cloud security side. So really team talking for sure about making prioritization and vulnerability management call again with the CISA uh, kind of stepping in heavily and uh, generally speaking, uh, NIS2 here in Europe stepping in heavily on saying, this is our crown jewel, we shall protect them properly. And really stepping on with the SEC mandate on reporting breaches in a timely manner, but as well putting in a good and a bad way liabilities on the CISO if the product security and if the product is not secure enough. And I think I've seen with that a whole motion of organizations start taking application security more serious or putting it in the center of their strategy. Now, there's been a lot of FUD and a lot of um, fear and fear mongering on this bomb uh, kind of legislation and people needing to produce SBOM without understanding what, what that purpose or what that mandate was for, that is really understand your asset inventory uh, from what you build and where you run it. Um, but in general, there was a whole motion of um, application security now is in the agenda of a lot of CISO. The challenge is not a lot of CISO understand or coming from a development environment. So there've been the question of, okay, what do I have? How do I paint that picture? And how do I give direction to my developer that is not just silly SLAs? And a lot of people understand OWASP top 10 and assessing by OWASP top 10, but application security is much more than just the OWASP top 10, is what you build that is now very complicated and where you build it and where you deploy it and who owns it and who needs to solve it. Because luckily, over the days where we just use service level agreement or just pure silly timers to actually mandate what's need to be solved, because that has failed massively. And I finally appreciate Garner putting the nail on the coffin of SLA saying SLA don't work 100% of the time with a couple of interesting use cases um, that really brought forward the conversation of like, okay, how do we prioritize things and how do we apply SLA to things that are priority? And finally, cyber risk quantification that as a finance industry, we used to be a bit more advanced in this um, fairly 10 years ago, five years ago is where we really brought it forward. But then the rest of the world started catching up with the finance industry. Uh, that is very heavily regulated on on this um, and being trading desk, being managing a lot of money, um, the regulation can come naturally and uh, needs to and critical national infrastructure kind of mandate across the world really with India, uh, US and Europe in general mandating a better security posture as several kind of heart of element in the heart of the financial institution uh, between banks and trading organization kind of got hit between ransomware or breaches uh, related to application security. So in general, there was, okay, we need to step up our game, um, maybe relate to chat GPT or other AI tools, but I've seen, um, and I was discussing this with another another CISO uh, friend of mine at a very known cloud security company that also does threat intelligence research. And he saw as well a shortening times between a vulnerability being published and being weaponized. It used to be 30 days, 40 days. Now it's three days. So I don't know if it's a coincidence, but definitely we are learning how to defend ourselves faster using AI um, and automated tools, but also our attacker are going that much faster and they're not subject to regulation. So they are developing definitely exploit faster 
than what people can depend upon. And we've seen this with the breaches. With the with, uh, last two years, there have been more breaches around software security, either supply chain or uh, through stealing of keys or any variation of the sort. Um, so I'm really glad to see more regulation around um, liability on one end because it's going to bring really the subject in front of the board saying, I don't want to go in prison. <laughs> I need to understand what is the risk of the stuff that we're running. So give me the tool to actually do that or I'm out of here. And I think I've started seeing CISO having this kind of conversation around. Uh, there is a lot of nervousness, um, but I like to see the positive aspect of it, uh, of this debate that is uh, now the regulation has teeth. Yeah. Yeah, and I think you, you summed it up quite well the whole year with the SEC uh, notification, the the cases around uh, CISO responsibility and liability, and you mentioned SBOM as well, the Bill of Materials. And uh, I want to go to that last point with you as we start to transition into this particular case that prompted our connection today. Um, the Bill of Materials the SBOM stuff, a lot of effort in there, a lot of work from CISA here in the U.S. Um, to help at least U.S. companies, and I think a lot of a lot of folks around the world follow it as well, really get a handle on what's in the stuff they're building, bill of materials, right? And um, I'm wondering your perspective on this, because what we're going to get to here isn't necessarily what an organization is building, from a code perspective, it's what they're building from a workflow perspective. They're using yeah. services to build out business processes and workflows that drive action, right? Some, there may be points where humans interact with the workflow. There may be points where the systems just do their thing on their own. But their teams like marketing in this case have selected a tool Either they're using it in the cloud or they're getting IT to help them deploy it in some fashion. And then it goes into the business process. And in this case, there are some problems <laughs> that leave certainly so, that system, that system exposed and perhaps even the business process exposed at a, at a grander scale. So talk to me a little bit about, we're not going to name names here. Um, well, I'll, I'll include the thread so if people are interested to uh, to dig in deeper, they yeah, can. But tell, tell me, me a bit, a little little about bit. What, what you've done. Yeah. yeah, let me give a little bit of background. But before jumping in that, I think you raised a, a, a super interesting point. There was the SPOM regulation has driven kind of a laser focus approach on third party open source supply suppliers. And um, nobody wants to share what they're building for a reason or another. So the whole purpose of SPOM with the VEX and the vulnerability exchange, and that was a good initiative without, I think, understanding how organizations want to protect their IP and what they're building or how they want to share. In my opinion, and I'm going to close out this because otherwise we're going to talk about SPOM for the rest of the day and week. <laughs> There's plenty to talk about, um, that's for sure. Yeah. I think from that perspective, having a more risk-based approach on like what you build and where you run it would have been a little bit better, but maybe more complicated to demonstrate. So SPOM was the initial approach, but not the end goal. But let's close it there. Um, on the point that you were mentioning, um, I think I, I put my marketing hat and my non-technical hat in there, and that's what kind of scared me, but also made me think, and uh, I'm pretty sure uh, you told in the same way on there is there are kind of PII and confidential information or kind of user information that travels through websites that probably are not built with security in mind or are used as I spin up an event, I'll build this form with this CRM kind of systems. 90% of the time uh because development is expensive, I built it with pre-made tool. And that's WordPress in most of the cases with kind of some plugins that are usually run by marketing people that, that don't have expertise in security. 
uh, neither in business development. So they run, um, sorry, neither in, in developing uh, websites. So they run these tools, maybe they forget about it, and they become the gateway uh, of um, a lot of customer data. Because once you build it and once it works, it, it kind of gets used all the time. And in my previous careers as a CISO, respect, regardless if I was running enterprise, I kept on seeing WordPress popping up that should never appear in an enterprise organization. But because it was free, cheap, and cheerful to run, uh, people spin it up in a Docker container with a website, customize it a little bit with a form, and then forget to plug it in there. And because Attacker knows this, they target those forms specifically. So there is a lot of vulnerability that comes from these forms. Um, probably once per month, we monitor, we've been writing about this uh, on WordPress specifically. Um, at least we've seen six major vulnerability on forms or WordPress of likes uh, this year alone. And now you take that problem and you say, okay, I'll use an enterprise tools uh, and there are several CRM, well-known CRM systems or calendar registration tool that are the bread and butter of how marketers nowadays and how salespeople are running campaigns, small events. They don't want to build a website. They actually want to form. And we use it as well. Uh, as, as Phoenix as Phoenix Security, we use this because uh, we don't want to build a whole website if there is a tool that does the job for us and does the uh, CRM for us. But as a security company, we're constantly bombarded by people trying to prove that we're actually a security company. We can do <laughs> what we say we do. Uh, and 90% of the time ends up in an interesting conversation uh, with, I've seen probably both aspects of the world or both ethical hackers that just say, you know what, we discovered that this is a potential thing. And then you spend two or three um, cycles trying to explain to them in a nice way that that doesn't lead to anything. But in this particular case, a conjunct testing with an ethical hacker, and I'm going to leave the name as well in there, uh, for referenceability, ended up with the discovery of potentially SQL injection uh, on a well-known CRM system that um, wasn't acknowledged as a security risk. That's what surprised me the most. As um, yes, you can inject inject HTML tags in a form that should contain a name. And I stopped there for a second. And I said. How on earth anybody would accept an HTML tag in a name? Like, I don't know. I know pretty much a lot of the people around the world, but I have never seen one with an HTML tag so inside. Especially, think, think about the context for a minute as well. This is a marketing person. Yeah. Right? So or it or a marketing be... form engaging with somebody who's interested in that company's products, not an engineer who's no. trying to be clever. So there, there, for me, there's really no context where that that's a valid use case anyway. No, but apparently there are use cases for it. So when we raised the particular issue with a well-known um, calendar shattering company, uh, they acknowledged the, the issue immediately. They fixed it quite quickly. And that issue was a known issue at all because they say that, that there is reason on earth uh, why somebody will put um, a hijacking link in a name of a field or in a calendar invite that normally people will click. Um, and in the worst case scenario, people will weaponize this link because all of a sudden this invite come from a very well-known trusted company. Um, so you trust them, so your guard gets lowered. If it's your company, even worse. So you send to your CEO a click link from your own website. Likely, chances are that somebody will say, "What's happening in here? Let me check on it." Um, so it's it's a it's an easier way to actually weaponize those uh, tools. I'm not gonna disclose more information because we don't want to weaponize those tools uh, or, or widespread this, but raise awareness of. Um, I'm a security practitioner. I, I saw this immediately, and this has raised red flag. Now, I'm pretty surprised this is not, uh, considering we're 20, almost 2024. This should be, this practice are pretty much the basic and the bread and butter of application security. Any input validation or field validation against things that shouldn't be in there should be the norm. But apparently for some 
CRM system and other system is not the norm. It's an added benefit. Um, you need to buy additional license. You need to buy additional things just to get the basic security. And I think as an industry, we're pretty much fed up with the single sign-on tax, with the security tax of things that are really basics and shouldn't require additional configuration. We keep on trying to spread the word of security default, but if the tools that we build are secure, insecure by default, then we kind of lost the battle because we can't protect the whole organization and we can't convince any marketing person to actually rewrite all of the forms that they've wrote uh, to actually put input validation because there is no way on earth any organization does. And any organization that uses a CRM system right now is vulnerable of input validation of, of SQL injection or any form of injection um, yeah. if it doesn't rewrite those tools. So I, I'm going to spend a minute here because this is an important thing. You made a number of important points in this one one section here. The You said it early on. This is marketing team. They probably have a an event campaign that's coming up next week. They want to get as many people to it as possible. Cheap and cheerful. Get a page up. Get a form up. Drive people to it and get them to register. They don't want to spend a lot of money. They certainly don't have a lot of time, right, to to work on this. And if you're if you're requiring them to do special configuration, we're talking marketing people. Or no offense to marketing people, but they're not engineers. They're not IT. They're not ops. They're marketing. Right? They, they know messaging, they know how to connect with people, they know how to generate interest and get them to, to do things to connect with the company. They're not engineers. So to, to, to require engineering, to require additional expense, to allow them to engineer <laughs> the form. Uh, goes that's even more scary. Against, right? That, that's a scary piece. Um, so, and... To your point, to kind of wrap it in a bow, as you said it, I, I just want to make this very clear for everybody listening, is if if those hurdles are there in terms of time and money and it's not there by default, we're, we're kind of doing ourselves, a, well, the company's doing themselves a disservice, right? Mm -hmm. And I think everybody who's using this stuff are thinking, well, how, how do we then determine if a if a company we're using a form we're using a page we're using is secure enough and i'm going back to the marketer and it's who's not. making this selection right and the scary part is it's not it's, it's insecure mm -hmm. by default and honestly we're a security company we didn't talk about that because we assume at least this basic stuff that they were secure by default and when we found this we were fairly surprised that even those basic mechanisms weren't in place. And actually, you had to re-engineer very hardly the form, uh, causing a lot of friction in basically rewriting every form with input validation. We had workaround put in place to actually do that through another third-party system. But it's, it's not trivial to do that. And uh, it required quite a lot of thinking, quite a lot of reworking. Now, as a startup going to scale up, we have 20, 50 form flying around. So that was a fairly amount of work to actually sanitize at least the, the core one. Now, if I imagine a company that runs this a large scale, first of all, it will probably not be aware of how many forms are around. And second of all, sanitizing all of them will require a platoon of people to actually rewrite them quality testing and seeing if they work, this is insane. And that's what I thought. It's like, no, there needs to be a better way. And it wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what shocked me. Yeah. So uh, talk to me a bit about, and I'm, I don't want to over sensationalize this, but I want to go back to my point on the SBOM typically being focused on what's being built. Um. So what's open source services, what commercial services are you bringing together? What's in your software, basically, right? Um, but let's look at the bigger workflow picture. So a form, presumably, is at the front end of a lot of stuff, right? 
Yeah. Um, certainly in the CRM, it, you can envision it sitting in front of a lot of well, all the marketing pipeline stuff, right? Which naturally transfers to sales stuff, which translates or gets connected somehow to revenue systems. <laughs> So well, if depending on depending on the flow, you might find this weaponized field throughout the entire organization. I don't know if I'm. I think there are two aspects. No, no, no. You're perfectly right, and I think there are two aspects of it. There is the probably SQL injection or a, a number of injection that could reveal kind of customer data. That that is probably I hope so handled. We haven't seen a case. Uh, where that was enact, enacted because the, probably there are compensating control on the back of it. So if you manage uh, a system, um, now if you're using WordPress, there have been a lot of remote SQL injection or remote um, RCE that are probably more dangerous from that aspect perspective. But a more interesting case and probably the more scary case was where this was used to weaponize and run phishing campaign on your behalf uh, injecting HTML tag saying, hi, Mr. Click here. So you will be suspicious, but if that is a hyperlink of hi, first name with a hyperlink, you would say, mm, weird, it, but it comes from a, a trusted SPDX, so um, a trusted and verified uh, domain, Phoenix Security, for example. Um, let me check, uh, because it passed all, all the check through Gmail, and Gmail still interpret HTML tags um, in a specific way. So it can be used to use your company and you have absolutely no knowledge until your client base comes and say, look, you're sending phishing emails and this is not a trivial way to block it um, because it's, it's, it's widespread across your whole organization is using your trusted system. So back on your point, yes, we made the whole point of secure default and uh, threat modeling, but then we kind of hyper fixated on just a way to build application um, that is just as bomb. Um, there is much more in application security than just how, which open source tool do you use? Um, even just in the case of S bomb, S bomb wasn't purposely built to just look at what you build, but was the gateway to say, look at your asset inventory, how you build application, where you run it, what is your risk profile, and how can you be smart about fixing or who you should be aware. But in conjunction as well with uh, secure code review and uh, good practice around application security and threat modeling, and this particular problem falls exactly in the place with threat modeling where you look at a business process, regardless if like in this particular case, it doesn't have any code linked to it because you're using a third party supply tool or a third party tool to run business process. And because it's no code, it's actually gonna be used by very low skilled people with zero security uh, knowledge. And this will probably more likely go through pre-approved or not even pass through security at all. So wouldn't even pass through the normal gate that you will go through for a threat modeling exercise. Um, and and that's, that's kind of where I was thinking of, this is a very easy subject weaponizable case. And this is why you have these um, good white hackers that are testing these forms at scale and raising this awareness uh, across the board. And um, I wanna kudos uh, the good folks that actually do this without blackmailing because we had other people that were trying to blackmail as well are saying you have this and you and it end up being in unknown things and saying yeah we're going to smear your name and we're going to say that you're not secure even though we had evidence that that doesn't lead anywhere is is an un, is a known um unproven <laughs> injection or non it doesn't go anywhere but regardless there are good folks that actually do this uh for the sake of of the world to be a bit better secure place. And that's why I want to raise the awareness as well here that yeah. maybe we should look beyond just pure software security and looking at the threat modeling and threat exercise overall um, and letting the good tool um, manage fundamentally 
softer security so that we can focus more on just triaging vulnerability day in and day out. I don't know if it's been <laughs> coined. I haven't looked it up, but I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna call it uh, the the W bomb, the workflow bill of materials. And, uh, <laughs> So I, I want I want to leave this here. I don't want to belabor this point, but I, I think there for folks listening or watching to this, um, it, clearly there's there's a need or justification to say we need to look at the tools that our teams are using to understand how they how they fit in and then what what risk they bring to the organization, right? So this is yeah, it's third party risk management effectively what we're talking about here, but, but from a pure workflow perspective, I want to go inside now. So companies building products, um, clearly they can look at the OWASP top 10 that gets them a good start. There are plenty of other frameworks and tools and services to help them build better software as well. I, there is a point in here, though, that I want to make, and I'm not trying to throw any, anybody under the bus, but it, it was an interesting comment that uh, we've we've had other users ask about this, um, but we've only seen fake tests. We've not seen any malicious script make it through unless somebody's tried and it's unknown. I don't know what that's saying. We look, but we don't see, but it doesn't mean we find it. We might not find it. And I'm not trying to be funny here. I'm, I'm trying to be serious. People building apps. What, what's the right yeah. answer to this? How, how, how do you, let's say you missed that validation. It, things happen, right? So we'll, we'll talk about how you put the validation in place at build time. But let's say you, for, you don't do that. <laughs> what, what can you Some do? Reason. What can you do? That is not a bug; it's a feature. <laughs> yeah, no <laughs> sense. Of it's a feature that marketing people can engineer their way out in into a different feature set. Um, what what's the what's the right monitoring and response answer here? What what can app app dev teams and sec teams do to well, not, have let's that, not have that position? <laughs> Let's start maybe um, a little bit broader than that. That how do you handle a security report? Because those are getting like right now flooded um, across. Uh, everybody's running is raising security reports. So I have um, I feel for the security team because um, there are people that throw pieces of code from open source perspective through ChatGPT. Uh, we saw this with Libcur with tons of vulnerability being raised through their hacker one uh, report and 80 percent of them were bogus and just one actually made through and there was a lot of noise being done so i feel for security team uh, that received tons of these reports um, but there is a way to acknowledge uh, this and especially 2023 input validation is like really the baseline for everything and we saw a good response of like acknowledging, yes, we see it uh, absolutely. Uh, there is no place where uh, an HTML tag or a script index or a SQL injection should be in the name of a field that says name. Um, that is the answer that I was kind of expecting, not we haven't seen anybody weaponizing this, uh, despite the evidence in um, weaponization and the fact that those triggered an interpretation of the HTML tag that, that we just weaponized. So we haven't seen it with the evidence of this is the proof <laughs> was a yeah, little we bit. Seen it, we haven't seen it except for seeing it. <laughs> that was a little bit concerning. Yeah. But regardless, even if there is a remote case, acknowledge it. Um, say you're going to look into it, not saying this, this is never going to happen because it's the classic, our company is unhackable. Until it is <laughs> right, um, I think there is a, a, a decent response on this, um, and, and maybe it's because we, I think, Contra Security as well raised this uh, previously, saying there wasn't an official security channel, so there was just a community to raise these issues, and a lot of people that uh, run these communities are other marketers, so 
they want to contain the information. They might not want to raise awareness too much. Um, I don't know what the right response is, but this should have been a threat looked by a security person. And me as a security person, I would have jumped on saying, this is probably something we should look at. And it, it isn't, even if it's, even if there isn't an injection of the case, it could be used by smearing campaign or phishing campaign uh, across the board. So two or three scenarios that really can compromise the name of an organization, even if it's not a SQL injection script. Uh, there are three or four campaigns. Now, as a security professional, I deal with that on a daily basis. I'm aware of it. If, if I'm a marketing person, I wouldn't be. So if I put my marketing hat on, I would have just passed that report to a security person and saying, can we run a threat modeling exercise on this? Can we see if this is actually weaponizable? And if, even if there are other ways where those fields could be weaponized and maybe putting a secure default in there. So communication, I think that's where I wanna take this discussion to is absolutely critical on making or breaking a company when you get reported of a breach of an incident um, of the like. And I think we start seeing as well ransomware attacker pushing organization to pay ransom or reporting them, so blackmailing them on reporting them to the ICO or to the various, the SEC commission and uh, kind of forcing their hand. So I think acknowledging a security problem, first of all, is a good way from a PR perspective to save your company. Trying to hide stuff uh, is the perfect way to end, is the ending of companies um, and we've seen this plenty of approach, like 23ME, uh, very public breaches where they said, well, this is this wasn't it, but then it was it. Um, and, you know, I feel for security team because under a breach, you're under a massive amount of pressure. But that's why PR people should be trained on actually answering those kind of message in a proper way. Because a security professional... First of all, we're under pressure during an incident. Nobody want to answer something like that. And it should be no good playbook to give a proper politically correct answer because this is branding damaging and share damaging. If you look at two or three well-known names that did very bad answer, they kind of lost 23 to 40% market share. Yep. Yep. That's money. That's a lot of money. Yeah. It is money. I and mean, when everything is driven by money, you got to pay attention to that, clearly. Um, well, Francesco, I think, uh, yeah, clearly we could talk about AppSec for hours. <laughs> we can go a gazillion different directions with this. Um, I think we've highlighted uh, a few things, which is we're making progress, um, as you noted in the beginning. Uh, I think we, the the act of building stuff, I think we're getting better at that. Um, having a real time readiness to deal with the things where we make mistakes, because we are human, thankfully, still. Um, I think we need to continue to do, to do better there. That, that, in, that includes visibility yeah. and transparency internally, and, and then externally if something warrants. Um, but I think the other point that, that really struck me is this we're using tools throughout the business that have vulnerabilities. There's no way of getting around that. And so as a business, and I'm, I'm pulling together a whole series on security architecture. And I don't know how that whole thing is probably a little too high and left for this particular thing. I don't know that that would solve this problem necessarily, but just the whole look at what are we using? How are we using it? What's the tech stack? What's the flow? Where's the data? Who has access? What are the auths? I mean, that whole view, I think we need to do a much better job at. And I think we've. An we've, application we've, is more than a spawn yeah. and a piece yeah, of software exactly. that runs somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we're, we're doing a good job from the bottom up. I, I think I think we all need to take a closer look at our top down, is, is my takeaway on this. But uh, it's always always a pleasure, my friend. Any any final thoughts as we wrap up here? No, I think you, you've wrapped up perfectly with a top-down approach. That would have been my recommendation, looking at a broader spectrum, what it is, what is an application, start defining what is an application. Just because it doesn't have code, it doesn't mean that it won't process uh, credit card data, won't process 
uh, PII or your customer data, or it wouldn't have an impact on your business uh, overall. Um, maybe looking at your PR response, so getting a PR ready response for security incident and doing a triage on those incidents. I think looking broader and trying to, 2023, trying to delegate to machines the job of triaging so we can focus on the really important work of security pros, professional to actually run threat modeling, to run this intelligence work, the machines will never be able to replace us to do because it requires inference and intelligence view that hopefully, maybe in the future, we can automate some of this stuff with the threat modeling uh, and automated threat modeling and some of my good friends of writing. But uh, human are good in that, while well, machines are much better at prioritizing vulnerabilities. So let machines do that so that we can focus on really looking at the business overall and securing the business, not focusing on securing the individual vulnerability. Yep. Yep. We, <clears throat> we mustn't be afraid of technology to help us where, where it's appropriate and uh, continue to continue to tap in the, the most powerful machine. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Look at all human brain, at least for the moment. Uh, Francesco, pleasure to have you on. Good to see you, my friend. And uh, we'll, we'll certainly continue to chat about these things. And for everybody listening, please uh, please subscribe, share with your friends and your peers and your enemies, whomever uh, needs to hear this <laughs> message. And, of course, we'll link to... marketing uh, people. That's right. Absolutely, the marketing people. Good point, Francesco. And I'll include links to your profile so they can connect with you and links to uh, the LinkedIn post that prompted this conversation. And uh, you'll have a chance, Francesco, to share anything else you think is, is important to, uh, to help people understand this a little bit better and uh, take, take some steps, even if it's just thinking a bit more about what they have going on. So thanks, everybody, for listening and watching. Thanks, Francesco. We'll uh, see everybody on the next one. Thank you, Sean. See ya and stay safe out there. You too. We hope you enjoyed this conversation. If you learned something new and this story made you think, then share ITSP Magazine with your friends, family, and colleagues. If you represent a company and wish to associate your brand with our conversations, sponsor one or more of our columns. We hope you will come back for more stories and follow us on our journey. You can always find us at the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society. <laughs>